Okay. All right. All right, to give Phil a chance to get himself organised, Andrew, do you want to kick off with what you've got? Uh, yeah, thanks um, very much, Paul. I'll just share my screen. Hopefully you can see this when I press this button. Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, good to be back. Um, well, I just had a quick update on a few things that happened in the last month, really. Um, I um, I was heading towards retirement, but uh, they've made me an offer I can't refuse. So uh, I'll be trying to cram in a bit of work uh, in the hobby department before I go back to work in, in a couple of weeks. But um, I guess just a couple of highlights from uh, some testing I've been doing. Um, Aurora, you might not think radio astronomy when you think Aurora, but we had a really good Aurora, of course, uh, a global uh, large magnetic storm uh, towards the end of April there. And uh, I was making some measurements. I'm trying to um, uh, do some uh, radio detection of Aurora at uh, HF and also at um, VLF. Um, I haven't got anything to report there yet, but um, looking at radio auroras is still quite an interesting um, an active field in, I guess, geophysical radio astronomy. Um, and there are a lot of things still to understand about uh, radio emissions from the aurora. Um, it's actually quite a, an amazingly strong source of HF radio waves, but they just don't get down under the ionosphere often. Um, so haven't got any report there, but we did see the aurora quite nicely down here in Tasmania. And of course, I guess uh, in the US, you folks would have seen it quite nicely. I've got a camera, um, all sky camera looking at the sky and this is a, a, a 20 millisecond exposure and it really overexposed the uh, the camera and that was on our early morning of um, the 24th of April um, and this is um, a, what's called a keogram a north south uh, composite of uh, columns stacked in time and you can see a little bit of auroral activity earlier in the night but it really went quite active and um, it was quite a substantial storm and, and had effects uh, at VLF. So uh, Roger was mentioning Northwest Cape there. Uh, I monitor that for uh, solar flares, uh, gamma ray bursts, and um, it even influenced uh, to some extent the, the amplitude and phase. So it's the ionospheric currents induced by the uh, auroral precipitation. So that was quite interesting. And um, kind of a couple of guys have contacted me and have uh, started looking, looking at my data um, for this event and also the eclipse as well, um, which will hopefully produce something useful. Um, I put this little fella in here. This is our echidna. Uh, this is our anteater, our native anteater. And uh, that's just to remind me that um, I'm making measurements um, with a variety of antennas, but one of them is an earth probe antenna. So I basically have a couple of electrodes in the ground. And of course, this guy is pretty good at probing the ground as well for, for ants. So uh, he's 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 out there uh, digging in the ground while I'm trying to make measurements. Um, hasn't dug up my antenna yet, um, but this was with an earth probe antenna, quite simple. And um, I've been doing some tests with that, looking at directivity and um, works quite well at HF. And I've started to do some measurements of galactic radio emission um, at HF, our ionospheric critical frequency is getting quite low at night here. And that's the really good thing about Tasmania. Um, and that's why uh, we have a long heritage of low frequency radio astronomy. And that, that's one of my interests. And um, galactic radio emission down to a few megahertz. So trying to kind of go back to the old days, the stuff that was done in the 1950s and uh, do it with some SDRs and, and uh, make some measurements. Um, the other thing that we were quite successful in, uh, I've mentioned before, this um, two meter, uh, 144 megahertz meteor, uh, not meteor scatter, um, auroral scatter using these modern digital modes. Um, so if, uh, folks are familiar with um, WSJTX and those sort of modes. This is using Q6515C, which is a short um, mode with uh, quite narrow, um, tones, but uh, this is a local amateur transmitting, and this is a guy in Victoria. Um, some folks might know VK3 MAP uh, Brody in Victoria, and uh, we were looking at his transmissions, uh, Doppler shifted and Doppler spread. So we're trying to understand um, 
how the Doppler shift changes with your oral features, looking at magnetometer records and also records from a, an atmospheric um, uh, radar, which is measuring plasma velocity. So um, might produce a bit of science with that because that's uh, these modes haven't really been used for this sort of um, approach. So, um, so that's the uh, Aurora and we've been watching out for more of these things as well. Um, I guess, yeah, what I'm trying to do is just keep a lot of instruments running and pick up anything that happens. And uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, the other thing I've been mucking around with is my um, uh, loop antennas. And uh, I'm really just trying to uh, see what I can do with loops because they're nice and compact. And folks that don't have um, big backyards can uh, probably pick up some interesting things. Um, this is my, what I call a quad loop. Um, so scale, uh, each side's about five feet in uh, Imperial, about so 1.5, 1.6 meters. And there are four loops in here connected up to a um, uh, quite a nice low noise preamplifier, which has really got good uh, dynamic range and also good frequency coverage. and. This thing works quite well from, from baseband. I can pick up VLF stations with this right up to about 55, 60 megahertz. And um, uh, I do meteor scatter with this as well. Um, quite, works quite well. And it's quite quite directive. And I've been trying to work out a couple of things about this, the, uh, the beam pattern at different frequencies. Um, and also thinking about polarization. And uh, I think I mentioned last time I'm sort of heading towards making a bow tie antenna similar to uh, the folks in South Australia have, have set up um, and maybe using this type of amplifier instead of the uh, the one that uh, is used with uh, with those. But uh, anyhow, um, just yesterday I actually got some nice Jupiter S bursts with this. You can kind of see they're a bit faint in here, but uh, uh, you know, it just goes to show you can pick up Jupiter with a loop antenna. And this was during the daytime. Jupiter was not that high up in the sky at the moment, and it's quite far away. It's sort of on the other side of the sun. So I was quite pleased to get that, um, given, I guess, also local interference, which is always a problem. This loop actually is, is not too bad at uh, a common mode, rejecting common mode noise. So that's been quite good. So that's where uh, IO, or the um, IO emission was at 90 degrees longitude. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so people look out for Jupiter. I've been sort of trying to uh, compare my observations with folks in the US. Um, the uh, K4 LED uh, measurements are quite interesting. There, there's just a, a little window of time during the day when we get both get overlap, but yesterday wasn't one of those, unfortunately. And plenty of solar activity of late, so solar bursts coming through. Um, Always kind of good to see that your antenna's working. <laughs> well, you can see them. Um, try and keep the cat away here. He wants to have a look at uh, things. Um, the other interesting thing during the month, last few days, the sun's been really doing some something quite weird. Um, it does this occasionally. It produces this sort of continual emission. Now, this is um, the uh, Bureau of Meteorology's um, radio spectrograph at Learmouth, so up near where Roger was. Um, and this is on the uh, the 24th of May, sort of late in the day, but um, quite interesting uh, emissions from quite a disturbed corona. And I was seeing this lower down in frequency over a few days. So, you know, these are sort of wispy features drifting quite slowly and correspond quite nicely to some of the um, uh, the things that we're seeing, um, seeing higher up. So, yeah, a bit unusual. You know, the sun's a bit bursty at times, but this was a, a, an event that lasted for a few days. Um, still trying to keep the cat away. Uh, and then finally, uh, I've been doing a bit of Whistler uh, measurements again with an Earth probe uh, system. And uh, of course, the folks at ASV, uh, the Leon Low Radio Observatory, have uh, a system running for albion.org um, and they're producing some nice whistles from, from the system there. 
um, I keep a, a close look on that. And uh, I've been making some measurements of, of some of these things at, at home. Uh, I'm about 680 kilometres away. So it's kind of interesting seeing whistlers um, at two sites simultaneously. And this is an overlap of these two uh, events here. Um, quite short time scale. Uh, and this is down at, um, at VLF, um, almost ELF, so down at uh, a couple of kilohertz. And these are initiated by lightning uh, activity and then propagate through the ionosphere up into the magnetosphere and adducted around, uh, in this case, actually um, coming from the opposite hemisphere and delayed and dispersed, uh, delayed in time, dispersed in frequency. And the dispersion follows quite a nice um, relationship here, which is shown here. I've just extracted some points along this whistle that I saw. And um, you can get a, an idea of the plasma density in the magnetosphere. Um, and I guess that's a, a focus of the uh, the network that uh, the ASV folks are involved in doing some quite nice measurements over quite a period and, and building up some nice statistics. Um, I'm just seeing what I can do at the moment with some uh, quite simple gear, you know, essentially a, a length of wire on the ground and a, an audio interface. And uh, interesting on this event, I saw one whistler, but not the other. And that might relate to the, the ducting. Um, I, at, at first, I thought maybe the lightning um, off to the east coast of Australia might have been the culprit, sending a signal up into the magnetosphere and then to the opposite hemisphere and back again. Uh, but I'm pretty sure it's actually coming from the other hemisphere. Lightning up, uh, this is in Siberia, is actually relatively rare. And there's still a lot of interest in what's initiating um, whistler activity. Most of the time, it's probably from lightning in the magnetically conjugate region. But there's a lot of evidence still that um, whistlers are being ducted over long distances from other regions. So I guess I'm just trying to build up a bit of a picture on that. So, yeah, just a few things there. Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I won't be able to do as much of uh, this sort of real-time monitoring as I uh, as I was expecting to do in the next few months anyway. Frank. All right, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I was going to comment, nothing nothing much gets past Andrew. He sort of uh, seems to be picking up everything that's going on. But uh, it sounds like, Andrew, we're going to lose you for a little bit. You, you're not going back to Antarctica? Uh, don't think so. I might get on the ship maybe, but, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll still be keeping my gear going, but, uh, and I'll still come along to these meetings, but, uh, I won't be able to muck around most of the day <laughs> on this sort of stuff. Yeah, well, that, that ups the game for the rest of us. We've got to have something to report. Um, so Phil, are you, uh, ready to just give us an update on, on, uh, our LMRO? Yeah, I can do. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> we had a, a an interesting time in February, just at the beginning of February, where I organised for our group to actually go to Parks Radio Telescope in New South Wales. And when we were there, we uh, spruced our little dish antenna, our radio dish, and uh, they were very interested in our um uh, amateur efforts <laughs> and they even suggested that we should collaborate with them and that they would help us uh go forward and do different experiments and whatnot and that was all great and we we all came back from that uh that ex experience because we had a bit of a tour of the the dish there and everything it was ex excellent little um exercise to go there and learn a bit we came back and we started to look at our dish and it had developed a clunking noise when it tilted between 45 degrees and going forward and 45 degrees and coming back. So we thought, oh, I know what's going on here and I'll just share my screen a bit. So we, we got up into, uh, can you see that? You should be able to see that. Yeah. We got up in there and had a, a bit of a think and we thought, oh, no, this is bad news. <laughs> um, where did he go forward? There's a forward. So we pulled this thing apart and we were looking at our worm drive 
And what we discovered is that uh, the actual worm inside, which is made from bronze, that pushes the um, lead screw, which is, can you see my mouse? Yep. Yeah, this is the lead screw that goes into it. That was fine. That's made out of like a car, out of, um, oh, what is it? Mild steel or whatever it is, the carbon steel or something. It's quite strong. But the inside of here, it's made of bronze and is actually designed to wear away if um, and be the sacrificial part, if you like. So we pulled this thing out and discovered that uh, the inside <laughs> had actually worn away at one end, not at both ends, which is really interesting. It sort of started thick at one end and it became thinner and thinner to a knife edge at this end. So the actual uh, lifting and, and lowering of our dish ended up uh, wearing away the, uh, the actual worm drive. So we're in a spot now where we're trying to repair all this and that's taken away all of our efforts and <laughs> energies and time for doing much else. So um, what we have done, um, oh, that's that. there's showing the full angle at which this occurs. So to explain, I believe the reason that it wears off at one end of the worm and not evenly across the, all the the gear is that as it goes up on an angle the weight of this end is causing the um lead screw to come through on an angle so it wears the bottom because it's the bottom that was worn away not the top so yes last week we um where's that now last week we actually put our efforts into looking at the uh, Radio Jove and started tuning the antennas and things because we have changed antenna wires and things. And uh, that's where our efforts are going to go for the meanwhile, whilst this gear gets replaced. We tried to give that gear to um, the original supplier and they have changed owners and whatnot. And the, the new owners tried to contact the original suppliers and haven't got any word back, which is somewhere in America. <laughs> so yeah, we're in a spot where we're looking at getting the uh, part fabricated here in Australia. So we're getting it measured and drawn <laughs> the whole bit. Not good, not good news, but um, it's all part of the part of the, um, the exercise of radio astronomy is maintenance. We've learnt from it. Um, one of the things we were not doing properly is maintaining um, or re-greasing that part enough. It's also not covered with um, bellows to keep dust off the grease. So we've learnt we're going to now get bellows on there and set it up so that there's no dust and, and, and air flowing over the grease. And hopefully we'll grease it more often and maintain it and it'll last a bit longer than the four four or five years I think it's been and that's that four or five years we've, I think we've re-greased it twice we should have been re-greasing it once a month <laughs> so yeah lessons learned um, and that's pretty much where we're at at the moment. Um, Phil the transition to the new ASV website is that has that progressed as far as our data flow is concerned? Yeah, I'm doing a course for, for those who don't know. Our um, Astronomical Society of Victoria just decided to change the website, but they didn't bring along with it all of the uh, radio astronomy data and um, trend graphs and charts and things. <laughs> so they've turned to me and said, "Phil, can you do? Can you get it all over?" And I'm going, "Well, I don't know." anything about the new website so there's a course for me to do this uh monday night and hopefully in the following weeks i'll get it across so yes there's nothing nothing showing at the moment which is a little bit frustrating but we'll get there yes yeah well, it's a good source of data but um yeah it's great great yeah. when it's online but um we will wait with bated breath yes see, see what happens next um yeah. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Phil. Um, Roger, do you have anything 
from New South Wales that you can tell us about? Um, not particularly. I think we've all been busy rushing off to this eclipse. Um, we also had our South Pacific Star Party, which is our um, you know big thing that we do for once a year. Hasn't happened for a couple of years thanks to COVID. Uh, that was last weekend. So yeah, most of the society's been busy doing that. So um, not a lot from me really. I've been a bit busy, as I said to uh, Rich before. I'm about to buy a couple of the basic kits to you know, start my process happening here. Uh, I have been sort of talking to plenty of people in the association and I'm sort of hoping by the star party next year, I'll actually be able to have some form of a uh, you know, demonstration to put on there for them. But at the moment, it's all still a little bit in the air. My, my dish has got a counterweight on it, which I don't think it, it did have last time. So it's progressing, but uh, I need to get the gear to put on it before I can do much, much more. Um, apart from that, no, nothing else that I can really think of. We've still got a few key members here, uh, but yeah, that's, that's all starting to come together. That's about it, really. We're in a similar situation with, with what can we take to these public outreach uh, days and weekends and so on? You know, what, what can we do in the name of astronomy that is uh, is going to engage people and give them a feeling for what's actually going on without blinding them with maths or, or um, you know, physics or whatever. Yeah. And that's a yes. real challenge. Um, mm. Rich, Rich, you probably have similar issues when you take it out to the public. Um, it's it's a bit obscure. People understand optical astronomy, but radio astronomy is a bit, <clears throat> a bit obscure in some ways. It doesn't have to be. They, they don't like the fact that a, a little peak would make us really excited and uh, an oscilloscope, and uh, they just don't get it. I don't. Yep. <laughs> I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that. That says something about us, doesn't it? Really, I think. Um, yeah. Roger, okay, did yeah. you get? Sorry, did you get clear skies for your star party? Um, yeah, on the first night, unfortunately, the last night, which you know, the Saturday night should have been the best. It was clouded over. Uh, Thursday night was pretty good. Saturday night, uh, Friday night was okay. You know, wasn't transparency wasn't great, but for the people who came from the city, it was wonderful. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, we did get a couple of nights there that were okay, but it, it could have been better. Yeah. So, and as we've been we've been struggling here, there was a the Messier star party, and that didn't happen. And then I think it was going to go online, wasn't it? And then that didn't happen. And I think, is, are they doing a moon, Phil, are they doing a moon one as well? As far I as believe they're, they're trying to, yeah, organise a... Week, well, I've got plenty of sun coming in. You can see a lot of sun coming in, but it's still cloudy. Uh, yeah, so who else we got? Um, Peter, South Australia, what's, what's happening over your way? Good morning, gentlemen, oh, for those of us in Australia anyway. Um, well, actually, the reason I'm here today was um, basically to find, try and find out what's happening over in the ASV regarding the Callisto installation. And I think Phil's probably uh, answered half the question I had. Um, thanks very much. And um, I guess uh, with regard to our Callisto installation, uh, we're sort of a bit lonely this side of the world. We're the only people in Australia, apart from perhaps um, the bomb at Learmonth, that are actually looking at at this stuff um, from from um, uh, and sorry, Andrew's probably doing it as well. Um, and we were sort of trying to encourage a few more people to get involved. Um, to that end. The Callisto um, network is about to go into a um, a development phase for a next generation Callisto. But uh, in the short term, as we approach um, Solar Cycle 25 Solar Max, um, we're trying to uh, get a few more people interested in what's actually happening on the sun because it's, it's certainly in the last year or so it's uh, got a lot more active and well last 18 months and it's probably going to get a lot more active again so um a couple of years ago when clint was involved with um 
with the Callisto system at the ASV, uh, we sort of made an approach to say, you know, would you guys be interested in like a collaboration with us to develop uh, a few different types of systems. At the time, I think you were putting that big dish in, so you are pretty busy then. Uh, so there wasn't a great deal of interest on your side, but um, I guess we're looking at um, doing the same thing again, perhaps. Uh, I mean, we're a bit further down the track than what we were two years ago. And um, perhaps we can help you guys out because I, I know you're offline at the moment as far as Callisto is concerned. Um, yeah, so I guess that's the reason I'm here is to just to drop in a bit of a fact-finding mission and, and maybe put a, a face to a name or two. And um, perhaps be in touch. You, you've got a very good Callisto installation, I believe. Is that right? I've seen uh, it's, of it. it's working very well at the moment. We've just... Yeah. Um, We've just introduced a system based on the MWA, the Murchison Wide Field Array um, antenna and, and uh, low noise amplifiers. So that's running, that's currently running between sort of 70 megs and 275, sorry, 300. Uh, but that'll probably change. The MWA antenna is a bit stretched down at um, 70 megs. And um, we probably need to turn that into a, a cross pol a circular polarized system rather than two linear polarization systems. But our, um, our LWA system is probably one of the better ones around. And, um, and that's probably what we'd like to talk to you guys about is putting in a, an LWA over at um, uh, Bendigo or Heathcote. So, Peter, we actually did um, look at doing that as a part of our um, budget for this year. And then when this dish uh, worm drive fell over, the the value or the price of fixing that has sort of put a stopper to us. But, yes, we are intending on doing what you, you're talking about right there. <laughs> it is something on our uh, on our sites definitely so well, yes yeah, just keep that in mind just so happens i've got a spare lwa antenna in my front yard at the moment and uh, that that includes the the front end electronics and a few other things so you know like i said we can we can probably help you out if you if you want to go that way there's there's a possibility yes get in touch with us um after this and we'll we'll talk about it Absolutely. Sure thing. Okay. Sounds like, sounds like a trip to South Australia is in order, Phil. Sounds like fun. Well, actually, <laughs> actually, my mother lives in Melbourne, so. Um, oh well, even better. Sort of on the way. Yeah. Get your trailer. Yeah. Um, For, um, it, yeah is, is, is your data that. is that is that streaming to um, through the public website or is that just going out to the central database? It's I'm just going to the Callisto website. Uh, yep. we've, the ASA website is pretty, um, let's say, strictly controlled. And uh, we, a, a couple of years ago, we actually set up our own, or probably 10 years ago, um, the radio group set up their own, uh, our own uh, website, which we ran for a couple of years. And then everybody sort of got busy doing other things and it fell in a hole. No. Uh, but we only did that because the ASA website's so inflexible. Yeah. It sounds like the usual story. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> Web uh, webmasters tend to be um, hang on a bit, a bit tightly sometimes, probably for good reason. But yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I'll try. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Peter, no Peter, it's Andrew. Andrew here. Yeah, that's great. Look, uh, it'd be great to have the ASV folks doing that because um, it's a fair bit of work, obviously. Uh, but yeah, really valuable to get more sites. Um, still things to look at, you know, with solar bursts. Um, and the more sites you get, um, you know, you can start to look at um, 
some of the finer details. I guess, you know, once you sort out sensitivities and resolutions and things like that, there's still a few open questions in, in solar. And I guess you get slightly more longitude, which is good for keeping the continuous monitoring going. Um, and if you can go down in frequency too, um, you know, more into the HF, uh, down to the ionospheric cutoff, uh, that's quite interesting too. And um, yeah, I used to do a lot of solar um, high resolution stuff in the early days. And it seems I've been catching up with the literature and yeah, there's so all the things, all the mysteries that, you know, were around when I was looking at this in the eighties, um, pretty much been solved, but there's still a few interesting things. So uh, yeah, very much encourage, uh, yeah, keeping the sun under, under scrutiny. <laughs> And now is a good time to do it, as you say, because things are happening and they're probably going to get better as well. Yeah, well we've probably got a good four years of, um, yep. of, of high intensity um, solar activity coming up. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the age now where the solar, solar cycle 26, I'll probably be drilling into a tube or something. <laughs> So um, as far as I'm concerned, now's, now's the time for us to do it. Now's the time for me to do it. Um, with rega uh, regarding Andrew, um, actually, we were watching your all sky camera during that, uh, during that uh, aurora the other week. And uh, Andre, Michael Andre Phillips said to say hello. <laughs> Well, Andre, yes, Andre is a bit of a legend. I, I've known Andre from Antarctic uh, days, and uh, uh, yeah, I survived uh, him uh, taking me up in a light plane at Saskatoon once. Uh, so hi to Andre. Yeah, <laughs> he's up at Canberra at the moment. Mm. Yeah, he's got a nice Doing... camera going and, and has been mucking around with meteor detections and a few other things. So, uh, yeah. Actually, the other thing yes. um, to mention is that, you know, um, the Bureau of Meteorology who has their Space Weather Services uh, section. They had the Kalgoora radio heliograph or radio spectrograph going, and that, that hasn't been running for a number of years. And Learmont is really the only one that they run. Um, it'd be interesting to see if there's any op opportunities for the amateur folks to you know, provide some data to BOM because you guys are seeing things earlier in the day than um, Learmont does. And um, I know that the uh, the space weather network around the globe, if they have um, a site in the Philippines and there's one in Guam, I think, and quite a few others, Sagamore Hill in the US. But um, it, I mean, that might provide another opportunity or another um, uh, uh, angle on, on your, your measurements. I don't know if that's possible. Yeah, we, um, well, as, as we understand it, there was a power failure at um, Kalgoora and it's not going to be fixed. Uh, I don't think uh, either BOM or anybody else has um, got the money or the inclination to do any of that sort of stuff. Um, and, and as far as all the space weather stations seem uh, are concerned, it, it seems like uh, this is all a bit of a legacy from the US military and no doubt that's why Learmonth is where it is and why the station at Guam is where it is and the one in the Philippines is where it is. Um, but as far as um, regional governments are concerned, I don't think any of them are particularly interested at all. They have enough trouble with um, keeping their own backyards um, out yeah. of the weather as opposed to what's happening um, in the sky above them. Yeah. So yeah, it'd be it'd be really nice to um, do thing do more. I mean, in I know in New Zealand, the University of Auckland had a site, had a Callisto up at um, uh, anyway about seventy k's north of of Auckland, uh, but the university was told to, to cut a few funds, and that was it. They just shut the whole place down. It's, it's actually on the just about to be taken over by 
another company called Space Ops, who actually run a satellite ground station in the South Island. And uh, they're going to be running um, the old facility north of Auckland um, from the end of June, I think it is. But they're a commercial company and they seem to be very commercial. So I'd be very surprised that they, if they dip their toes into, into um, let's say, philanthropic type things like this, as, a, uh, as opposed to making a buck. Yeah, that's, so, right. that's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, with uh, moon missions and all that sort of stuff, folks will be interested in proton vents and type 2 radio bursts and all that kind of stuff feed into that. So, you know, there's still a need for that monitoring. Uh, I guess it just depends whether the network's strong enough at the moment or their needs. I presume, you know, NASA and all the other space agencies have kind of looked at this. But, um, um, yeah, the Australian Space Agency might also be interested, I don't know, um, in supporting some development. I don't know. Uh, I, I might have a bit more contact with those folks uh, over the next few months. So I'll see, I don't know. If I can slip in a question about that. <laughs> yeah, we've we've actually been reaching out to a couple of um, different organisations in order to see if we can get another site somewhere. Certainly in South Australia, we talk we talked briefly uh, late late last year to the University of Tasmania to use their um, their Sojourner site, but. Uh, I think if we had have gone there with ten thousand dollars and and said, you know, yes, we'll help you keep somebody semi-employed for a couple of months, uh, they would have probably let us in, but uh, that wasn't going to happen. So, so you can only ask, and they can only say no. Yeah, yeah I know those folks. We've been trying to get a an all sky camera going at. Um, this, well, their observatory, which is also a SpaceX site, but uh, uh, that's yeah. If you've got the money, you can uh, get in there. But yeah, I know the problems. Hmm. We need a we, we need a rich philanthropist, as you say, someone who can just dip in their pocket and chuck us a million dollars or something. <laughs> um, I feel I wonder whether CSIRO would help pay for the cost of, of fixing the dish, but they're probably short of cash as well. No, I don't think they're going to fund us for things like that, but they will help us with projects. Yeah, well, that's mm. true. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, Rob, have you got anything from your end, Rob Lucas? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, um, what I've done is, um, you know, well, we went to the total eclipse at X mouth and I've also had give you an upgrade. Uh, see if I can, uh, you know, share my screen with you. Hard part is to figure out where I put them. Can you see my screen? Oh. Not yet. How's that? Here we got it. Oh, yeah. Spectrum. Well, that looks overexposed, but, um, you know, on my screen, it looks okay, but on the, the projection, it doesn't look good. Anyway, what I did for the total eclipse is this is a uh, flash spectrum, you know, during the total eclipse in the middle of it. And you can't see it here, but I can. But, uh, you know, if you take a look, uh, you can see the iron 10, iron 14, H alpha, calcium K, lines in it and when uh, I've sent these photos off to uh, to be analyzed by the by the specialists okay um, I'm sorry it doesn't show up as well as it does on my screen and the other thing is um, I talked to you about uh, you know building a, you know an observatory out at uh, Waruna and uh, this is uh, the status of it now uh, all the pieces have been put together and it's a matter of finishing it up Looking good. Okay, and this is a mistake. Let's see if it plays. Yeah, it's playing. This is from X Mouth. This is where I changed the filter, and unfortunately, you can see off to the side. You know that you know 
And what it was supposed to do was supposed to maintain focus, and it didn't do that. But you can see the size of the uh, of the corona, you know, how it spreads out. Mm -hmm. So basically, that's it for me. Right. Well, must have been a great experience heading over there, I think. Even, you hear me? even without even without the eclipse, I mean, it's a great place to go. And there's a there's a really good series on television at the moment with um, uh, looking at the uh, that area. I don't know whether anyone's seen it. I'm racking my brain to think what it's called. What's what's the area there? The Ningaloo. No, yeah, Ningaloo. 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 There's a, a series of, on Ningaloo right at the moment. Um, our American friends, I don't know whether it'll reach you, but it's well worth a look. The, the photography is absolutely amazing. Um, I have no idea what happened. Just a beginner. Yep. No, all good. Uh, and I think our last Australian is Joe. Have you got anything at your end, apart from that crazy sky that you've got behind you? Um, no, not a great deal to report. I still haven't progressed very far with the station I'm building. But um, as as an aside, I signed up for um, um, Chat GBT day before yesterday. Uh -huh. uh, within an hour, um, I chose something which I do know something about, which is uh, uh, CTs, um, the medical CTs. And within an hour, I had a working program or a um, to uh, look at an image and do a CT on an image. I described the image to ChatGBT and it drew the image for me, which was just a phantom. And I then dissected it into uh, what's called a sinogram, which is a, what a CT, what a CT machine does it with three x-rays and then to get from all the readings they got to reconstruct the image again, um, which I sort of blew my mind a little bit, I gotta say. Um, so it's, uh, I've, I've been playing with that <laughs> quite a lot for the last couple of days. It's, uh, it's been extraordinary. Um, um, I, I, well, was, uh, I thought I knew a little bit about this artificial intelligence, but I had no idea how advanced it was in this chat GPT. And that's on the... Um, the older version of it, rather than the um, GPT four, I think it's called. And on the background, if you now you mentioned it, is a, a painting which I made, oh. which I, um, but I used artificial intelligence to do it uh, in the <laughs> style in the style of Van Gogh. I thought with the stars in the sky. So yeah, yeah. That's I what, thought it was Van Gogh. But... Yeah, that's what Great. I've been. The last, uh, the last little while. And apologies to Phil and uh, all the Australians. I couldn't get to the, um, to the last meeting. Um, uh, family matters. Um, so that's that's about all I've got at the moment. I think. Hopefully, I'll have something more concrete to report on the dish next time. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Joe. And just on ChatGPT, it's interesting that um, certainly in Victoria, the government schools have banned. Chat GPT, but the independent schools are embracing it. Um, I'm in independent schools. There's a lot of lot of potential with that artificial intelligence. It just we just have to learn to use it properly. That's yes. The key. Yeah, that that was the thing that I found out very quickly that uh, um, uh, that I had to uh, for this CT uh, program, which it wrote for me and it works. I can I can demonstrate it to you now. Um, yeah. It um, um, I, I I sort of tried to do everything all at once, but then I broke it down into uh, individual steps, and said, um, on top of the step you've just given me, which now works, can you please do this? And it would write the program for that. It's all in Python. It's all part of my learning Python uh, business. Really, is all what it's all about. But uh, yes, that, that's uh, I certainly learned that you need to be able to speak to it. Um, uh, in a very clear and concise manner, and uh, it yeah. will do. It will do amazing things. Yeah, Phil, that might sort out the uh, ASV website for you. <laughs> <laughs> Worth a try. 
Yeah, I hope so. It's, um, it's great for translating software. So yes. I work in IDL and I've just been getting it to translate stuff into Python. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's great for programming. You can, if you can break down things into units, you can, you know, it's great for graphing, um, contour plotting, and all sorts of stuff like that in Python. Yeah, it's, I mean, from the schools angle, it's really interesting because uh, when email first came along, schools banned it. They said, this is terrible, you know, who are you talking to and child safety and all that. And where would we be now in schools or in business without without email? Then um, things like Wikipedia came along. Wikipedia, oh, that's terrible, you know. It, everybody's writing it. It's all just who, who are these people who are writing it? And yet Wikipedia is a really good starting point for kids at school doing their research. They can get an overview of a topic and then they can look down the bottom. There are all the references, then go off to the references and, you know, the real websites and away you go. And I think it's the same with ChatGPT and similar. Um, we, we, yeah, we've got the aspect of are they cheating? Uh, it, my argument with my students is always, well, you're just cheating yourself, basically. But um, in terms of from a teacher's perspective, there are tools that we can apply to see whether it's the student's work or whether it's artificial intelligence. So there are ways around it. Teachers just have to work out how to how to use those tools so we can authenticate student work. Um, and in, in my case, I just put it on the student. You've got to show me it's your work. Um, you know, we do a Viva or we do cross-referencing or whatever. Um, but in, certainly in science and in our field of radio astronomy and so on, the, the artificial intelligence has enormous potential. Um, Rich, I don't know whether, what's the situation in the States with that sort of approach? Actually, I would, I would just say this objection to this sort of stuff goes back a long, long time before uh, Wikipedia or the, the internet. I remember them objecting to us having calculators. Oh, um, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it goes back a long way. It does, yes. Although calculators Sorry. have had a negative effect on, on numeracy, I have to say. You still you still need your mental arithmetic. Yes, oh, I do agree. I do agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's really important. But yeah, so, yeah, sorry, Rich, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think chat, everything you said about chat GPT and the AI stuff is the same up here. And uh, I think the uh, the innovation students have to use, uh, do anything but do their own work is amazing. I mean, they, they're very innovative on uh, having uh, computers do their own work and uh, other stuff. So uh, that in, in, in a way, that's really good. Um, but they don't do their own work. They basically spend more time figuring out how not to do it and get it done, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but I think it's sort of fun. I mean, I always, I always let them, uh, when I do, uh, my, my astronomy course, I basically say, you guys can use anything you want. You can use the computer, you can use your phone, you can do whatever. Um, but if you do that, you're probably not going to finish on time. Yep. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, it's, it's easy if you just do it, you know, by yourself, but if you have to go look it up, so go ahead, try it. Try it. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, okay, you guys had this is good stuff. Um, I think that's it from Australia. Anybody else, Australian, and then got anything to chip in before we go across to the states? No, I think I think we're there, Rich. So over to you. Yeah, and, and as I told Ted, it's not the states; it's the northern hemisphere. Okay, right? because we have all. I mean, we got. Germany, Russia, uh, you, you know, not Ukraine, I don't think, but uh, we got everybody up here, uh, all over the all over the world. So, um, and uh, and speaking of that, Ted Ted Klein is a, a software engineer, and he's uh, been. If you've looked at the YouTube videos, he's done the uh, Easy RA, right? At Radio astronomy, not EZRA. By the way, it doesn't sound as good. And uh, so it's a. Uh, anyway, he's going to present a, you know, we came up with this, we want to do a Northern and Southern Hemisphere survey, and Ted's equipment and software is instrumental in that, so he came up, and he's going to uh, present you a, a 
a worldwide survey for hydrogen. So go ahead, Ted. Very good. I'm here. Let's see if I can share. Things are happening. And if I do this, do you see blue? Yep. All that. Well, we'll give it a try. I hope you see the same thing I do. Uh, all right. So uh, earlier this week, uh, all these Sarah members, Rich, Jay, and me, we walked into a bar and we had a real nice lunch. And we started talking. We were talking about radio astronomy, of course. Um, and we talked about big things. I mean, really big things. Talk about the galaxy here. We can see the galactic core here in yellow, and down below is an itty bitty spot where the sun is. And on this picture, we can see all kinds of galactic arms running around. So I had a bunch of radio data, and I tried to recreate that. This is what I came up with. Uh, here's the sun in yellow and the galactic core in green. And are there arms there? I'll let you decide. Uh, does the data really support that or not? I don't know. It's kind of close. Uh, so this graph is actually provide, uh, created mostly by another graph, this one here, which is almost the same kind of stuff. But you can see there's a whole bunch of blackness up here in the upper right. There's a bunch of data missing. We need some more data over here to fill in that spot. Um, that plot was created by these dots in green. These are all right along the galactic center, right at latitude zero. Uh, the green are the dots, and the red is the galactic plane itself underneath. And you can see there's some spots where the galactic planes uh, peaks out because, again, I need more data. Some places I can't get to. Uh, the, uh, when the telescope lo looks down, it looks down into the ground. So that is blocked by the Earth. The easiest way to collect data is just do a drift scan where we point the telescope up in the sky and just go away, let the, letting the computer collect all the data. It'll start on the left and because uh, uh, over here on the right, and uh, because of the Earth's rotation, we collect data as the Earth rotates. And we find a little bit of energy. We go along here, we find another little bit of energy, and then back to the right side again for the next day. Uh, the bumps here show just a little more power in those places. Well, that's encouraging. That's where all the hydrogen is along the galactic core. So that a uh, galactic plane, I should say. And so that makes sense. And we get data for two spots along that galactic plane. Okay, well, that's good. If you do a whole lot of drift scans, oh my, well, then you get little bumps everywhere. The bumps seem to line up in the right places, and that's encouraging. Uh, for every one of those little drift scans, you get two dots, one on the left and one on the right. Okay, that's good for the galactic plane itself. The uh, telescope I was using a, for a bunch of that was this LTO 15, 15 for 15 feet. And sure enough, it can start way up here at the top and look at the uh, Polaris star up at the North Pole. And in fact, go all the way down until it runs into the ground. I can't look through the Earth. We have another dish over here, LTO 16, uh, very similar, uh, but it has no motors. And so I can bring it up here up to straight up vertical bird bath, but I'm having trouble mechanically actually rotating it around so that it can look farther north. But now if we consider a telescope in Darwin on the north side of Australia, uh, it can almost, it's so close to the equator, it can almost see the whole radio sky. And a little bit farther south in Christchurch, uh, it uh, can see the southern sky very cleanly. Well, that's all good. We were chatting away, but we're an organization. Maybe we should get organized. So we had this idea that we'd come up with a survey and get some of that data and share it from one hemisphere to another. We can't spell very well, so we came up with SHUS for Sarah Hydrogen Observing Overall Survey. To play this game, let me bring that up. 
I think you can see it big now. Uh, you need a 1420 megahertz antenna with a no low noise amplifier, some kind of USB receiver, uh, an RTL SDR USB dongle. The, the cheap receivers work just fine. So that's good. And some kind of old PC would be just great. It could be a laptop or a desktop. Uh, do set the clock to some local time zone or maybe coordinated universal time. We have software to support Windows and Ubuntu Linux. That seems to work. And uh, some software. Uh, there is Easy Radio Astronomy, Ezra. It has a program in there called Easy Call, Call for Collecting, Collecting Data. And that runs on top of Python. Or an alternative is to use the old uh, scope in a box solution, which is SDR Sharp with the IF Average plugin. Although I think that's limited to about a thousand samples, and that kind of runs out in about two days. So every two days, you're going to have to push buttons to make it start up again. But the idea is let's collect a whole lot of drift scans. Uh, if we start with the telescope pointing north at azimuth zero and pointing up a little bit off the horizon at 45 degrees elevation, turn on the data collection and record that part of the sky. Maybe a week later, you come back and you change the antenna elevation, maybe one beam width more towards the south pole and just keep working your way along, inching along running the program every time you uh, starting the program up again each time you uh, change the elevation and then uh, it's probably important to record the elevation somewhere inside the data files even easiest or log a paper log or a computer log or in a file name or maybe a directory name would work as well the daily data files are about 5 to 12 megabytes but you can compress the directories nicely into zip files. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, to move the files about, I just use a USB drive, and that seems to work nicely. Where are we going to put all this stuff? Maybe in a Sarah Dropbox? Maybe in some Google Drives out there on the web? We'll have to figure that part out and how we move the files around. We do this, and then we'll go this way. Uh, so here's that website for Easy Radio Astronomy. I'll show this to you again at the end. So now if you did use Ezra, um, it has a whole bunch of parameters. And you can put those all on the command line, or you could just put them in an easy defaults file, since they really don't change. Things like the observatory's name, maybe it's in Perth, maybe it's a three-meter dish. The program needs your latitude and longitude on, on the Earth, and maybe the altitude uh, above mean sea level here in meters. I suggest you make reference samples where you are measuring hydrogen, frequent, uh, uh, hydrogen data on one frequency and another place where there is no hydrogen data, and that way we can compare the two more cleanly. 1420.405 is where all that hydrogen is, but way up here at 1423 megahertz, there really should be no galactic hydrogen. You're going to be telling the program the azimuth of the telescope. Sometimes it's to the south at 180 degrees azimuth, maybe to the north at zero. If you have two of these in the same file, that's fine. The last one is the one that gets read and counts. Last one wins. So essentially every week you go ch change the elevation and you come down and you run the program again. Somehow you run Python, you find the easy call program, and you tell it what the elevation is for this data collection. In this example, 45.3 degrees above the horizon. So... Uh, we hope you'll consider participating in SHUS, the Sarah Hydrogen Observing Overall Survey, 
And here's that website for Ezra again. I open it up to questions. I hear Why do you need more than 24 hours at any declination? Uh, I run it for 20 for seven days. Uh, the program will just uh, keep averaging those things, and that improves the signal over the noise. We're just uh, stamping out that random noise. Sorry, uh, Ted, you, you said you're running for seven days? I run it for seven days and then go get another okay. uh, elevation. Okay, well, the data which I'm putting together is only 1.5, so it's going to be a very broad thing. I'd certainly be interested in doing something with it. Um, uh, but it's going to be fairly broad. Does um, Is that going to be a much of a problem with the, with the sort of, instead of having it at 45 degrees, it's going to go from um, whatever the, the beam width, I think, is about 8 degrees on the, on the size dish that I have. I've worked it out to be about 8 degrees. Um, the dishes that I was working with have about 4 degrees. And so uh, I think you'll learn a whole lot from this, and let's find out what what happens. Okay. Uh, I'm going to zoom way back here. Sorry for all the flashing. But I have uh, run this kind of software, not quite with the galactic arms, but I've gotten galactic hydrogen from this antenna, which is just simple 11 element uh, Yagi yeah. with a PVC tube. Uh, we put a uh, ground plane on the side of this one, which is just a corner reflector made out of insulating material you'd put on your house. Uh, the same thing here for these horns, you've seen that out of West Virginia, the, they're popular. Uh, they have fancy wooden frames on it. I just strung it up. This was the high school project. Mm -hmm. I've uh, gotten hydrogen out of this dish. That's a simple little itty bitty dipole on the end there with the L uh, LNA down the PVC pipe. Uh, this is a bunch of discs that you can buy. It's really a Yagi. Uh, and you can also look up Wi-Fi gun on the web. Let me, oh, this one. Uh, and you can see that this is just a bunch of metal discs with some threaded rod in the middle. Now, I will say that fancier, bigger antennas work better. But it is interesting that you can keep getting hydrogen and learn a lot about all this with even simple antennas. Here's the scope in the box. And then uh, my backyard is eight foot. There's a 10 foot at an observatory nearby. And then these other bigger 16 foot dishes, much less uh, riches, 60 foot. We got to get that one in action too. But uh, this is to encourage you to give it a try, see what happens. By all means, I'll certainly uh, have a look at that when I do eventually get this thing up and running. Uh, Just thinking, the, uh, there's the Space Science Education Centre in Melbourne, and they have a dish out not that far from our own at um, Heathcote, and uh, only government school students can access that but it might be a project they, they're prepared to take on. Ted, uh, if we can, um, I'll try liaising with um, Emma. Emma joined us a few meetings ago, and uh, there may be something there where, you know, they can leave their dish running and grab a week's worth of data at a time, see, see what happens. Kind of low maintenance this way. That makes it easy. Absolutely. Set, set and forget. Hmm. Yeah, I'd certainly be interested in, in participating. We should be able to get something happening here, certainly on smaller dishes anyway, that we can put together fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. to, yeah. And so likewise down here, um, I've got my little um, satellite, X satellite TV dish out and I've ordered myself a LNA and I'll muck around with that. Also, at the University of Tasmania, we used to have a um, 
Gee, I think it was a five meter, or it might have been a 10 meter. Um, it was used for third year physics projects. And uh, I should find out what's happening with that because that was actually a hydrogen line system. And uh, it'd be great to uh, even get some, um, just even students, you know, involved or interested in that again. Now, a five meter is pretty big. Uh, mm. That's a four and a half. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it was an out as system, but uh, yeah, I, I built a, a, I think it was a 32 channel filter bank spectrum analyzer for that <laughs> about 40 years ago. It was a different age. Uh, Rich, you want to take over now? What do you want to do with this data? Well, show some of the, uh, the resultant pictures that we can get from it. Um, I think the... Uh, well, one is uh, we would like everybody, well, one is this This will cause everybody to get their hydrogen equipment up and running, have some place put the data, see how their data contributes to the, the overall picture. Um, if you can fill in that right-hand side, uh, the Southern Hemisphere, that'd be great. Uh, we're gonna get the uh, Northern Hemisphere guys to try to fill in the Northern Hemisphere parts. Uh, and it's okay to fill in uh, stuff that's already looks like it's been uh, done. Uh, more data oh, yes. is better. Uh, we can always screen. If we think the data is bad, we can always screen that. And in fact, we'll give you feedback and say, okay. And, and I expect that if it's bad, it's because you have a lot of RFI, your time zone was off. And so everything was shifted in time. There's various other things, but the feedback will allow you to improve your system and so the next set of data will be better is, and that's really sort of the goal is that this is to get your systems up and running and to learn how to take survey data. And, and by the way, we will have access to all of the, all the survey data. We're not gonna, you know, keep just your line available. You guys can use this and use TED software to process the entire picture with all this data. Uh, if you look at his YouTube videos, it'll explain how to do that. So um, I think the, um, this is, and, and this is going to go on for a while. So it, it may take you a couple months to get your antennas up and, uh, and start producing data. And then maybe a, a, a month or so after that and to prove that you're, you know, to tweak your data to make sure it, it, it works right. And then after that, you start taking data at different elevations. Um, and uh, you, you might, every time you do like maybe five or 10 degrees elevation change, the next time you may want to do one degree elevation change. You want to fill in the, the holes until we that's completely green and doesn't have just stripes in it. Uh, so uh, anyway, so we're uh, uh, this is going to be a sort of a, a multi-year thing, but uh, I think what you'll see is every month you'll see an improvement based on the data we got, and I think it'll be exciting. Uh, you even have the idea that perhaps students could use this as a STEM project, for example. Well, I, we've already um, graduated a, a guy um, from the HAMSI group uh, that uh, used data that I collected here on the nine foot dish um, with a, a Spectre Cyber. So, and then we actually had one student uh, go to state in a science fair using the same hydrogen data uh, and was able to do a, uh, you know, galactic, uh, mass observation with it. So you'll find that this is having this database of very good data um, is going to be useful for students and for, you know, all observations mm -hmm. from now on. It'll be an asset to both organiza all our organizations. Very good. Uh, I think I'm done. <laughs> Well, it's been excellent work, Ted, based on all the software you've been producing, and now we have a chance to work it, and everybody can produce these pictures with that software, and it's free download. So, uh, uh, and I, I think if you want to um, participate, uh, let us know, and we can help you. We can help you jumpstart your systems. Uh, and I'm saying the uh, we'll accept data from anything as small as a scope in the box. I know it's a high beam width, but the goal is. We can, I mean, 
once you get that working, and uh, we'll show you what that data looks like, uh, even though it's a uh, your beam was pretty high. Uh, and then uh, you'll you'll probably want to go get a bigger dish and plug it in and do it again. So uh, and then you'll see how it improves with a bigger dish. Well, so, be, uh, be a pioneer for others who, that uh, only have that little dish. Let's find out what could it, what it can really do. Right. I have a question. And you don't. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, have we got like a, a web page set up for this that we can all look at, or is this not still too in its <coughs> infancy? Uh, well, you're going to have this YouTube video, and then we're going to work on that. Yeah, uh, yeah, because that would be really nice to have something that we could use as a portal or something. To, we could put I'm gonna, data there and all that sort of thing. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, well, that's uh, – thank you. We're going to uh, – the three guys who walked into the bar are going to figure that out. On the yeah, next no worries. So, uh, Early in uh, its infancy, right, it's a good week. idea. I like it. <laughs> well, now, what, what would that website really have? Some place to provide the files or uh, yeah. deposit the files, the files, I guess, yes. or the overall? Uh, we're going to have a video like this up on the Sarah YouTube channel, I think. That's already right. produced. No worries. No, oh, good. Yeah, I'll have that up and, here in the next uh, next couple of days. And we're going to pioneer it and figure it out along the way, I think. Um, I think if you, uh, let's see, what one is uh, uh, let us know next month uh, during next uh, Drake's Lounge Australia how you're doing, uh, what help you need, uh, and we'll tell you where, you know, what advances we've made on this. Um, uh, let's see what else could we do. Um, if you go to the Sarah listserv, we'll start uh, putting some content there saying, uh, here's stuff we've got. You can ask questions to the Sarah listserv. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that, uh, just, uh, I don't know, we put that on the uh, chat real quick, the, what the listserv address is. Yeah, and, um, um, my email's on that web page, so I want to help. All right. Anyway, should be fun and uh, get all your students to do it. And uh, we'll take any data and we'll, you know, we'll QA it. We'll say, oh, it's, it's, there's something, there's something wrong with the data or you got RFI or if you got, here's how you improve your antenna. Here's how you improve your, your time zones off, which I expect the first batch to be that the, uh, everything shifted in time by, you know, by an hour or two because of time zone on the, uh, the data. And I think that Ted can fix a lot of that stuff, but uh, just to let you know, here's the, some of the issues with uh, collecting radio astronomy data. And we'll get all that figured out. All right, any questions? All right. Uh, over, in, over here in South Australia, we've got a few people with uh, bed baths that do drift scanning. Um, so I'll pass on the, um, the GitHub address to those guys and um, perhaps we can uh, make some sort of contribution towards it as well. Perfect. Uh, just got a quick question. Um, as I said to Rich before, I'm about to buy some some gear that will start me on here, but there's now things like a uh, low noise amplifier. Can I get that sort of stuff locally here or do I get a 1420 low noise amplifier through you guys? Probably I, one for I, the Australians more than anything else. I, I got mine locally, Roger. Okay. We just do ours uh, on uh, on Amazon. Yep. I mean, if you get if you order through us, we're basically buying it from Amazon and shipping, having them ship it to you. All right. So. Oh, um, okay. Uh, okay. Yep. In in Go that ahead. Ezra, there are a couple of web uh, PDFs that talk all about hardware, and they have essentially part numbers. They may even have websites. Okay. I forget. Make Sounds sure you good. go to okay. make sure you go to Amazon Australia, Roger. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I've been I've done that before. <laughs> and, and as yeah. I say, I ordered mine. the The electronics arrived next day, and the mm -hmm. dish arrived. It took about mm, between a week and ten days. Shipped. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. Anyway, like I said, I'll get this stuff for the. Uh, Radio Jove that I I think I should be able to adapt to this system anyway. I uh, just need an amplifier and the software and find an old computer. 
Yeah. You should be able to do that. Uh, the popular amp amplifier seems to be the Noelec Sawbird yep. for 1420. Uh, yep. It's nice that it has a filter in it, and it's nice that it has an amplifier on both sides, in and out. Uh, there are fancier ones, but that's a good start. Uh, if you want to play yep. with the resistor for kind of reference single samples, uh, the bare bones version allows you to have that connector to make that happen as well. Okay. So I've only bought bare bones. Okay. Yep. So there, there's one of the resistors. One right there. Okay. Mm. That, that was Amazon Australia next day delivery. Okay. And if and if when you get the um get the RTL, get the smart T one. So that when mm. you put them together, the, the RTL powers up the LNA. The keyword okay. there is T. Yeah. Yeah, T. Smart T. Smart T, yep. And they're, just, they're just joined together, and away you go. And then I'm not sure that there aren't two kinds of smart T's. Uh, my software supports RTL SDR chipset, and that's the simpler one, probably the cheaper one. Joe, you're holding up something. What's that? Uh, yeah, so the, well, it's just a the beginnings of what I'm planning to put up. This is the, oops, wrong, wrong hand. This here is the, um, oh, well, I beg your pardon. This one up here is the, um, uh, I got it from RTL SDR. It's a 1420 amplifier with the inbuilt filter. Um, I did get it directly from RTL SDR. I think they're in the States. Um, and the, Amplifiers here. This is the LNS, a couple of LNS which I've got in line, yet to be tested. I got, I think, from AliExpress. They use the um, SPF five one eight nine two chip um, as as an amplifier, um, and supposedly, I think, from memory, about 0.4 dB noise figure. So. Uh, they, they, they are they are around and the biggest problem I'm going to have here I've got this one for which is an FM filter um, or probably will really need a digital interdigital filter for where I am I live at the, the bottom of a of the uh, main transmission tower for all of Melbourne um, there's stuff behind me so I've got it really is a very rich RF environment um, I've often thought about powering Putting a, a little globe up and putting mm. the wires out and see if we can light the globe from the amount of RF I've got around here. <laughs> so I, I really am up against it as far as that's concerned, but uh, we'll have a go at it anyhow. Joe, you're doing a very neat job. My LNAs are usually just in baggies, little plastic yeah. bags. So, uh, but <laughs> in your it. environment, that may be necessary indeed. Yes, I certainly think it will be. Yeah, yeah. So, so the challenge we have for the Southern Hemisphere group is, and the Northern Hemisphere group, is to uh, get your get have your antenna just looking straight up. Uh, make sure that uh, Ted's got your lat long that you measured it with, and get at least uh, one or two days of data um, as a starter shipped to him uh, via his email uh, or Dropbox or whatever we come up with. And, um, and just to see what it looks like on the system. Uh, and once you've got that starter uh, data file figured out, then uh, you know we'll maybe send some tweaks or maybe we don't need to. And then uh, you start collecting at different elevations and collecting longer to get the averages done. So I think um, uh, that, that's your challenge. Get, get your first data set done and ship it and uh, get some feedback on how it looks and then you're off and running. You're now hydrogen observers and uh, to see how much we can get. And it doesn't matter what size antenna. You know, I got a 60 foot dish that, by the way, it looks like a soda straw at 0.8 degrees. It'd take me 10 years to get the entire sky with that thing. So that's not totally, I'll get better data, but it'll, it'll, it takes too long to get significant amount of data. So having a smaller dish with a little wider beam is a lot better. Uh, for, especially when we're starting. 
So when uh, you send me data, I ask that you compress it first. A zip file would be great. All right. And we'll work out a Dropbox account or something like that. That uh, as soon as you tell Ted that uh, you've got uh, data you're, you're playing, then uh, we'll hook you up with a Dropbox account where you can uh, download stuff into it. And then we Ted can have some place to have, gather all the data, big, big chunks of data. I think Alex and I just recently discovered as well, my Gmail account uh, refuses files bigger than 15 megabytes. Yep. Um, we'll find that out along the way. All right. Okay. Uh, any other questions on the shoes? That, or, Ted, pronounce that properly, or is that uh, so I don't, uh, is it shoes? I was thinking like shoes. Yeah, so shoes. Step, up, step up to shoes or something. We'll have to think about that. We need to ask the question, Paul. Is there is that the way the way he uh, is that acronym uh, means something different in Australia that we should, uh, we should it's, know? It's, about? it's not a rude <laughs> word. It's not a dirty right. word. Really. <laughs> just just checking. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think you're quite right to check. <laughs> Australians do funny things with some words, but yes, yeah. you could ask Chat right. GPT what it thinks. I th I think the slogan should be "Step into our shoes." Yep. Oh. <laughs> Very good. And then when we've got all the data, we can have a shoey. <laughs> I see the minds are turning already. This is that's good. right. I got it. And I think if good. Philip would just send us some more Foster's Ale, we'll come up with an even better acronym. <laughs> that's it. Still, still, they may not know what a shoey is. I was going to say the the, 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 the people Formula know. One racing car drivers started it off, I think, and when they won their race, they would fill their shoe with the wine or the champagne and then drink it. It's most disgusting, yeah, <laughs> but right. that's that's the latest trend, and they call it a shoey. When when Ted gets plus or minus ninety degrees of uh, of data, we'll we'll have a. Sh Drink shoe. champagne out of a shoe, I guess. Yeah, yep. that's it. <laughs> Hooray for computer graphics. All right. <laughs> right. All right. I've got it. Um, uh, I, I think that's great, Ted. That was really good. And uh, I'm saying when uh, next week, when uh, Jay and Ted and I uh, go have lunch again, we'll come up with uh, probably we'll tweak this to get some more stuff or get make it better. OK, um, I want to show you something I just made. Um, you know, I've been. Uh, if you guys have looked at the YouTube channel, we do the radio astronomy formulas uh, series, and um, uh, my next one. Uh, and by the way, I did the. Uh, uh, if you haven't seen the Stokes parameters one, I didn't know anything about. A lot of the stuff is I didn't know how to. I didn't know it when I started it, so I had to go figure it out. And then I wanted to make sure you guys have a place to go, especially as amateur radio astronomers that uh, a lot of this data, you know, it took me, I mean, I'm doing this for five years and uh, I'm still learning this stuff. So this is a place where you can actually jumpstart. I don't use any calculus, it's all straight math and uh, very straightforward uh, calculations. So you guys can actually figure out what, you know, what Stokes parameters are, what noise factors are, things like that. Uh, gains of antennas, beam width and all that. What's how, what are the formulas based on wavelength and stuff? Okay. so. Um, my next one is going to be interferometers. Uh, they're trying to put an interferometer up here at the, the uh, Deep Space Exploration Society site. And, um, and uh, Wolfgang's got one in Osterpeeler, and a couple other people are trying to put one together. I think one of you guys are going to put a, uh, try to get an uh, interferometer going. So um, I put together a quick Excel file working all the equations from the Krauss book, Radio Astronomy. And I came up with, let me, uh, let me share here. Okay. So um, what this is, is uh, <coughs> I basically have taken a sample time. I'm assuming a drift scan and I figure out how much uh, uh, you know, we get the uh, one degree is equal to four minutes for the drift scan on, as the Earth turns. Uh, over here, I can figure I can put the distance between antennas 
the frequency, the diameter of their antenna, and then I can uh, I can change the uh, width of the I mean uh, change the uh, sample time on the antenna. So what this is sort of showing is a fringe. I've got uh, a four meter dish, two four meter dishes at 40 meters apart and 1420 megahertz. And um, in Krauss's book would tell me that based on that, that my uh, beam width is 0.55 degrees. And watch when I uh, drop this thing down to 10 meters, for example. And uh, now my beam width is 1.73 degrees. See the way all the, these work? And, and what I did was, there's, there's two effects I have here. One is you do a drift scan. If you look at the video I have on the gain loss and pointing on a single dish, it, it, the, uh, the object you're looking at is starting off in the east and then going to the west and uh, it has a, if you're drift scanning, you're, you're basically pointing south or north and you're, uh, you're looking uh, and the, the antenna sees a, a very low in the horizon and then comes across the top, assuming you got the antenna at the same uh, declination as the object. And so you, you basically will lose, uh, you have a low signal and then right when it hits dead center or south, it's uh, the highest signal and then it goes down again. So you get this, you get this uh, curve here based on uh, the, uh, you know, ju just having the, uh, uh, you know, just having the antenna do the drift scan. And then you've got, as the signal comes in, you've got a distance between the first antenna and the signal from the, the second antenna, which that distance, depending on where the, the object is, forms another, another signal path, which is out of phase with the first antenna. So the second antenna sees an out of phase signal with the first antenna. And that out of phase signal causes these interference patterns here to happen. And so basically what I did is figured out how to take that, the distance, uh, you know, at, at any degree and then uh, figure out the elevation pattern and then, uh, and then added them together and it came up with these fringes. If you, uh, I think if I do, hold on, let me see. This is an example if I have a single dish and then if I have two dishes and I want to put them one meter, well, let's see, it's a four meter dish. Well, let's just do a scope in the box, say. And uh, we figure out if I had a scope in the box, let's say it's 0.5 meters. And so it's a big wide beam here, right? And then I want to put it at uh, two meters apart or I want to put, uh, you know, 10 meters apart. But 10 meters apart, I get a fringe pattern and I have about 2.31 degrees beam width. So, um, so you can take two scope in the boxes at 0.5 meters and eventually get a 2.31 degree beam width for the combined effect. And that's the difference between this, the, the center beam and here and here. All right. So that's what we're looking at. And, uh, and just the farther you put them apart, the better. You know, say it's 50 meters apart, you see here's the fringes. And you've got a uh, 0.48 degree beam width. So, you know, the, the, the logistics side problem is that you've got to have, this is assuming you've got uh, two single paths from uh, cables at equal length coming into a single uh, RTL SDR, and then that's combining them there, and then you're getting these uh, fringes. Uh, during a drift scan and it starts at the one side and then goes to the other. So you're going to see all the bumps and then you're going to have to figure out, you know, the, the zero point and then you get more bumps. So um, I believe it's possible, but uh, this is just do, doing the math on, on how to do that. Now, Rich, this assumes a point source. Is that true? Yeah, that is correct. And you could tell on a point source, the fringes come all the way down to the bottom. Okay. If you did the sun, the sun is a 0.5 degrees. What you would see is that the 
these would not come to the bottom. There would be a, uh, a max and a min, and then they would basically, the, the bottom fringes would float. So you can tell if you're looking at a point source versus a, 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 a extended source uh, by doing that. And, uh, and I did that. That was one question I was going to have, you know, on Ted, uh, is a hydrogen cloud considered a point source or an extended source? And would we get these fringes to be floating like that? And they wouldn't go down to the bottom on hydrogen. Uh, because... I think you'd have many, many sources. So it's not a point source and you would never see an interference pattern. Uh, it would just be a blur. Yeah, that's so. I'm not sure. Yeah, w whether this would work for our survey or not, if we had a, an interferometer. What you're up. doing is measuring one point in the sky, and then you're measuring another point in the sky as the Earth rotates, and then right. you measure another point in the sky. Then you start playing with Fourier transforms, and you finally get back to image world. Right. Uh, it's it's an exciting ride. Right. However, this is not Fourier transform. This is basically phase difference uh, from time of arrival. And you get the yeah, same answer. So there, there is a yeah. way, uh, what Wolfgang did was look at just the intensity at that center point that you're measuring right. as it drew a line across the sky, just like my little green lines had a bump at a certain right. spot. And so they were painting the sky with intensity and you know they saw bright things. It was fun. Right. Anyway, uh, I thought I'd show you that it's possible to sort of simulate the uh, uh, interference patterns uh, you would get, and uh, it agrees with uh, Krauss's book on the math, and et cetera. So uh, uh, just letting you know that that's possible. And uh, I'll put a little video on this, sort of show the, the quick math on how to do this set, the setup. Any questions? Yeah, quick question, please. Uh, the pointing offset of point, uh, minus 0.3 degrees, what's that indicating? Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, this one here, it, it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't do anything right now. What I was doing is I was trying to, um, I was trying to set up, that's one of my parameters that I didn't actually use in this, but I'm trying to set up, it's one of the inputs to one of the equations. Uh, but I ended up putting the equation farther in the system. So that and the declination, um, uh, there are, there are some ways to, tie the right ascension declination into the observation, assuming it's not, you're not actually pointed at the object, you're pointed above or below the object in declination. And that would change the, the pattern. So that's my future adds on to this thing. But uh, what you really need to know he, to do this, you just need to know the frequency, the diameter of your two dishes, the baseline, which is the distance between the two dishes, uh, and uh, at that point, you get the automatically calculate the wavelength, the half power beam width, uh, and you know the gain, the gain losses uh, based on the angle as you do the drift scan, uh, things like that. So uh, it just, you know, and this is still a work in progress, but I thought I'd show you guys that this is uh, very possible to do in Excel with simple math. To come up with these uh, these fringe patterns uh, for a, a basic uh, interferometer system. So anyway, let me stop sharing here. Hey, Rich, um, nice work. Yeah, that's really interesting. I noticed a, a few folks on the Facebook radio Astro amateur radio astronomy group have been doing some interferometry. Have you you look at that Facebook group? Uh, I have not. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, they're getting some good results. Um, I guess the th the interpretation is the the, the tricky thing, isn't it? Because uh, I mean, they're mm. looking at things like uh, let's see, I think they might have even like Cygnus A and a few other things like that. Um, and um, yeah, getting some nice which look like point sources, so that works. Yeah, nice. that's right, exactly. Yeah, uh, but yeah, sort of interpreting extended sources is quite tricky, but it's really quite a nice thing because you're getting more information you're localizing where the the emission is coming from um yeah it'd be interesting to experiment i've never done any, anything uh, you know along those lines but of course that's one of the foundations for um you know vlbi and, and various other important techniques for looking at, at uh, fine detail well, there's a book i did it show up in a facebook ham radio 
site. Yeah. Anyway, uh, there's a, a book, uh, Radio Astronomy Projects by uh, Bill Lonk, William Lonk, L-O-N-C, uh, who, have, by the way, happens to be a Catholic priest uh, in uh, uh, Ontario, Canada. And uh, he, uh, he, he's written this book on, and he uses, uh, uh, he's made himself a four gigahertz uh, system that he put on top of the university and uh, put 10 meters apart and uh, has done the sun and he does drift scans on the sun. And, uh, and that, and then he shows how that extended source shows up and that you get the, you don't, the men's never come back with the sun. The men's don't come back down to the bottom. They, they float. And you can tell uh, a lot of information about how far they come down uh, versus the peaks. And that gives you information about the source uh, and then, you know, et cetera. So uh, very interesting stuff with the sun uh, and they use four gigahertz. And, that, and that's what the Deep Space Exploration Society is going to do. They've got um, 12 foot dishes uh, and they're going to, I forget how far they're going to put this thing. I, they could put it quite a ways away, their second dish. And I haven't figured out what their exact number is yet. Um, but, What's uh, the name of that book again? I think it's uh, Radio Astronomy uh, Projects by William Wonk, L-O-N-C. And uh, anyway, uh, and they, they, well, the other thing he does is he makes a desktop on a Lazy Susan uh, with two, two beams and a, he puts a, a, a little transmitter about 10 feet away in, inside the house and he rotates the Lazy Susan and he has a little potentiometer there that feeds the, uh, the angle uh, to one side of his uh, strip chart recorder and then he gets the, the data with the other one and he can basically do that, uh, you know, drift scan, you know, by, by doing this with the Lazy Susan and having it feed the uh, angle. So uh, stuff like that is a uh, very quick little projects that uh, get your, uh, your big interferometer jump started. Okay. Um, okay. We got about uh, 19 minutes. Um, I don't know. Alex, you just want to give uh, you just put up a new video uh, about umbrella antennas that uh, we had on the March R top. Uh, you just want to give a sort of a teaser for that. Uh, well, I didn't, but you did. Thanks. Rich, I gave a presentation about three months ago, and I asked uh, Rich to strip out the portion of this uh, for this umbrella radio. And what I want to do here, let's see, I want to post post this link. Let's see. I think I just sent everyone a link to this new video. Um, I'm not going to go through all the steps, but I want to. I just want to show you a few highlights. Uh, because it'll give you some ideas on a feed for, for upgrading. Let's see. I don't know. Does this work? Can you see, is it, yep. are you seeing just the, uh, the presentation? Yep. Okay. Um, uh, the idea is, was to find a way of creating a, an inexpensive one meter dish. And this works. It's based on a photo, uh, parabola reflector and I found this cuff, this material called Faraday fabric. And it's highly conductive and reflective at, uh, at 21 centimeter frequencies. And it's not too hard to build. And the performance of this seems like it's very close to, or maybe even exceeds the basic scope in the box. Difference is this is, this is all you get. You can't really develop this too much. The scope in the box can be extended as I have on my other video uh, showing where you can add side panels and you can really refine it. But what I did with this and is appropriate for small telescopes and the scope in the box is to come up with this tuned 21 centimeter feed. And it's, it, it's, uh, it's low loss in that the, uh, the LNA is, is almost directly coupled to this little uh, SMA to F standoff. And so this winds up being a really nice upgrade for, for even a scope and a box system. 
and that's what it looks like put together. And uh, you, it's the uh, it's designed. You can slide it up and down the the uh, the center post of this umbrella, and um, that was the way I had it tied up one day because it was windy, and I ran I don't know eight or nine hour drift scan. Um, oh, so I mean that's what the signal level is. It's not fantastic, but it it's certainly above the noise level. Uh, this was uh, some of the overlay of, of a series of scans, and uh, I created this map. Uh, hey, hey, Alex, uh, yeah. your, uh, your slides are a little offset from your talk. Huh. Uh, well, that's probably, probably the internet. Um, yeah. uh, so, uh, so stop a second uh, and tell us which slide you're on and... Uh, like right now, I'm seeing declination plus 40 degrees. Uh, oh, OK. Yeah. This is messed up. OK, so um, this was this is an overlay of 100, 105 uh, five-minute scans um, and just showing you fairly good quality data. I mean, reasonable signal noise. And this is, uh, this is all of these scans converted. This is corrected for. Uh, velocity error and uh and displayed in relative velocity vs vlsr and uh this is a scan through from something like uh 17 to 24 25 hours or zero one hours through uh 40 degrees and it's a little noisy i did a three-point averaging and came up with that which isn't all that bad. And this compared to what I get with my refined scope of the box, there's some differences, but for a beginner system, it's not bad. And you can go through the whole video if you want to look at it. All right. And I, I think the Ted's, uh, Ted's software handles the uh, VLSR automatically. Uh, you guys don't have to do that, but that's something you're going to learn eventually on uh, on how to apply that. Uh, that uh, basically, the uh, local standard arrest is a standard uh, that you want to have because the Earth's turning and the uh, the Earth's rotating around the solar system. Depending on where you look, you will have a different velocity due to the Earth turn and the uh, the Earth's orbit that will cause your. Depending on when you take the data, it'll be different frequency because of Doppler shift caused by the Earth's rotation and the Earth's orbit. So that's the stuff that the VLSR chain or VLSR fixes. Um, but you need to know how to get to it and to apply it. And TED software does that automatically. I think Alex came up with a, a, a local approach to do that using a, a, a website to manually put that in. And then he made a, a model out of it and had it automatically applied, I believe. So. Uh, very, but this is all very interesting. This is how you learn how to do this stuff and to get pretty, you know, that's our, that's our pretty pictures we were after, right? Uh, question is, uh, how do you do that real time to show off at the, uh, at the local uh, astronomy venue? Uh, so, <laughs> well, thanks, Alex. Uh, let's see, Bob, did you have anything? Yeah, I have a couple of pictures I can show real quick here. Three pictures. Okay. I'm, I'm Bob in 5BRG and I'm in North Texas and uh, I've been slowly sneaking up on a uh, on a astronomy observatory I guess you call it I, I've seen the YouTube videos with you guys and uh, and some of the stuff that you've worked on so I thought I would show you what I'm doing here this is a photograph of a, a little I call it a cabinet that I built it's about a meter and a half tall and uh, all three quarters of a meter square and uh, then I built some steel pipes that have a piece that will telescope uh, down. Is my mouse showing up, Rich? Yeah, it works. Okay. So this, uh, this is, happens to have a, an antenna on it that's got a rotator. I've got a friend that I'm going to let him uh, utilize this also. But this has got power to the box now, and it's got uh, network. I've got fiber optic network that I've run. I'm about... I don't know, 500 
feet or uh, something like that from the closest other buildings and tower and stuff. And you can see in the distance, I've got another one of these swivel pipes and I've got two more in the trees sort of, or in, you can get down through there. So the idea is to build like a quad dipole arrangement. And I'm gonna be, I'm involved with the uh, HAMSA group here. And I've got some, what they call grape one receivers, which are really just a transfer to watch uh, like WWV 10 megahertz. So you can look at the ionosphere with that. So there's another small house that I'm building, which is this one here, which is about a meter tall by a half a meter square on the bottom. And that's gonna be located in the center of these four uh, dipoles so that it'll collect data from all four of those. I'm gonna to try to keep all the links and everything the same so I can look at phasing and stuff on those signals. And then I've also got uh, this box. This is my really my first box in the system. It's in a cattle pen and it's got uh, the fiber connections coming in here with power and network. And I've got a little pipe here with a camera mounted on it for doing meteor, I'm capturing meteor that are coming in and part of the global meteor network. And I put up a little quad, this, this picture was taken earlier, quad antenna for doing uh, SID type stuff, but I'm not happy with it. So I've been building a, a loop antenna and designing my own uh, receiver system. I've accumulated a lot of parts, but I haven't got them in place. I've got some ground rods to use for probes, do a ground type system. So I'm hoping to have that functional, but I move like molasses, it feels like. Uh, I'm, I've also keep getting pulled into other people's projects uh, like AMSAT and other people like that. But uh, hopefully one day I'll have this collecting data. I've got a couple of other antennas. Like I've got a five meter dish that I wanna mount, but. I got sort of hung up on the concept of how much it was going to cost me for the Azel system to move that thing around. I, I probably ought to try to get it going just doing the drift scan stuff. Uh, and I'm hoping to put that out there in that field close to this box as well and let it feed back into it. But I do have a lot of trees that are somewhat of a challenge for, uh, for the meteor work and would be limiting my sky a little bit for the dish. Uh, anyway, that's what I've got for today. I'll maybe hopefully show you some progress on this one time later. Great. <clears throat> uh, Helen, you got anything? No. Uh, Johnny Cox? Can you hear me? She is. Do you have me now? Yeah, you got anything going on? Um... I'm overwhelmed, fascinated, but overwhelmed nevertheless. So that's about it for right now. Okay, thanks. And uh, I think we had Johnny Cox. I don't know, is that, uh, he seems new to me. Anyway, um, and one other cool, cool thing, Paul, is that when I sent out the notice for uh, Drake Sounds Australia, Jill Tarter emailed me back and said she couldn't make it. Uh, she was busy, but she couldn't make it. So she apologized for not making it. And Jill Tarter is, if you're not familiar with uh, contact, and uh, she's the one that uh, Jody Foster represented as the uh, doing the uh, on that movie. That's the Jill Tarter ahead of SETI, you know, all that kind of stuff. So she's online and she apologized. She couldn't make your meeting guys. So, uh, we uh, we're now playing with uh, some fancy people, and uh, oh, speaking of that, uh, we found out that the uh, the person who uh, discovered the hydroxyl line uh, is our own Dr. Sander Weinreb, uh, that uh, has been in, a, in all our uh, all our meetings, and uh, uh, is putting together that uh, 2000 uh, antenna system. Uh, you know, basically radio astronomy camera. Uh, so, uh, so, and and I just looked at, I was looking at a reference that says in 1963, the Sander, you know, Weinreb uh, discovered this hydroxyl line. And so he gave, uh, in the last Drake's Lounge uh, last week, he gave a, uh, how he found it. He said that 
it hooked him uh, forever on uh, radio astronomy. And that's why he did that. He just looked over in that and he's 10 minutes later, he found it. So very interesting stuff. Uh, okay. Um, Paul, that's all I got. If I think we've hit everybody. I think that's it from here as well. Thank you. I have a question for Andrew. Andrew, uh, you had, uh, you spoke of a Facebook page with amateur radio and interferometry. Why do they care? What are they doing with it? Yeah, it's interesting. I just sort of, you know, uh, have a bit of a look at this. So I'm just getting it up. Uh, amateur radio astronomy Facebook page. Uh, 2000 members, a um, bunch of people just doing stuff with, you know, dishes, antennas. Um, but um, if you get a few of those uh, across to Sarah, I'm sure there are Sarah members in there. Um, there are a few, one. I've noticed some names. Um, we might get Jan Lustra to yeah. come along sometime, Andrew. That's right. Yeah, I've been corresponding with him. He's having some trouble getting his um, radio sky spectrograph going with his system. Um, but, yeah, there's some good, interesting stuff on there, but it'd be great to do uh, get them some of them along. Um, but, yeah, I guess not... It seems like not a lot of people are on Facebook. I guess for various reasons, uh, but uh, yeah, no, there's some interesting stuff in there. What one option, Rich, would be for me to post on that group because I'm a member of that group as well, and just okay. say these Drake's Lounge and Drake's Lounge Australia are happening. If, with your permission, I can uh, let them know that we're on. I'm perfectly happy to let you do that, yeah. and uh, have them. Uh, so just to give you an idea, um, we uh, we have about 413 SARA members. I mean, we've gone up 20% uh, in the past year. Um, we have 682 subscribers to our YouTube channel, and we've gone up about 400% since last year. Uh, and uh, so uh, get on the YouTube channel and subscribe. And... Uh, and send this, send the YouTube channel and the, uh, and the Sarah website to the, uh, I don't think we saw out, that, Andrew. But, yeah, uh, washing out. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so yeah somebody, but, uh, that might work. Oh, blurry. No, I don't know, can you put the link in the chat? Turn the blur off. Yeah. So you can put the link in the chat and then uh, we can have that, we'll post that. Uh, oh, it's gone away. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. We, so, all you yeah. guys subscribe, subscribe to the the website and the uh, I'm sorry, the uh, YouTube channel, and then uh, hopefully that that'll get people to be members, and then uh, they'll get all our notices and the yep. etc. So, yeah, advertise. I I love it. I was thinking that uh, if you're talking about Drake's uh, Australia here, that they could look at the old ones on the YouTube channel. Yeah. Right. That's right. Good. And Peter, right. your group, your group. I know you're new in this uh, group too, but uh, look at the past uh, uh, Drake's Lounge Australia videos. There's all sorts of you get caught up real quick. No. Oh. Anyway, Paul, that's all I got. All right, thank you, and uh, that's all from our end as well. So we'll we'll see you next month for the one of the minor meetings, and then three months time. What's that? May, June, July, August. Must be time for your conference then as, as well, I think. Yeah, Jay, you want to give any updates on the conference? Well, we uh, would welcome any presenters from Australia, New Zealand. So um, if you could uh, email me, I'll put my link in the chat. We have about three openings that we're holding for VIPs. And we certainly would include you in that category. So we have about three 30 minute time slots for paper presentations. Um, love to have you present. If you would rather just join and participate that way, um, we will be not just an in-person conference at uh, Green Bank in West Virginia, but also a global virtual conference. The um, conference language, of course, will be in English, 
but we do have uh, several other um, native language speakers that'll be presenting. Uh, we think we have it worked out so that everyone will have a translator available. Uh, if not, we'll count on Paul Butler to do the uh, the Mandarin and uh, uh, German <laughs> translations for us. Yeah, but no we'd love to have all of you participate if you could. The information is at the SARA website. Yeah. I'll put that link in the chat. All right. Very good. Okay, I think that's it uh, from here, Rich. Um, all right, thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you next year, uh, next month. See you all. See you Appreciate all next it. time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.